glory. You may be seated. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 16, I believe it is. I'll catch up with you. I'll get there in just a moment. Uh, but we pray, we would all like to have the guidance, of, the guidance of, of God. We pray for that in our soul, in our heart. God, show me which path to take. Show me the direction to go. God, I want your guidance. I want you to show me the way. God, illuminate my, uh, my direction, the, 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 the way I'm going. Give me a word from you so that I will know which way to walk. We pray for that. We want that. We want that for ourselves. We want that for our children. We're praying, pray, God, I pray that they select the right, the right major, the right school, the right college. I, I pray that they, uh, you guide them in the direction to go with their friends or their future spouse. You should pray that for your children. God, direct this in their life. I want you to listen to a few passages here. One, Psalm 23 says, He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul and He guides me in paths of righteousness. So He leads he, and He guides us. John chapter 10 says this in, in verse 3. Jesus is going to talk about the good shepherd. He says, To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the good shepherd that Jesus is referring to, the sheep hear the voice of the good shepherd, he calls his own sheep and he leads them out. So God leads, God guides us. Jesus says, you know my voice you follow me. And then the, the third part in the Trinity in chapter 16, verse 13, says this in John. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So it says the Holy Spirit guides us as well. So we see the Trinity. We see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both, all, all of them guiding us and leading us. The Old Testament attests to it. We, we, we read here in the New Testament, it gives a testament to, to the, the God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit leading us as well. So if all of that is true, why do we struggle? Why do we struggle with the guidance of God in our life? Scripture says God wants, He is there, He is able to guide us. Well, if we're familiar with Isaiah 53, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. So there's something. There's something, um, there's something different here. There's, there's a struggle going on with us and us being able to hear the direction or the guidance of God for, for us today. So what we're going to look at, Proverbs chapter 16 for us. We're going to see that there is an assurance that we can have in our life that God does guide and God will give us that guidance that we desire in our life. We can see the assurance of God even in the mystery of God. I'm going to show you that. God is a mystery. You, nobody sitting here, nobody uh, outside of Jesus Christ that has ever put a foot on this earth, understands God completely. There is mysteries about God that we do not know. No theologian today, no book has ever been written that solves everything. Scripture is still revealing itself. But if you're his child, he will guide you. Verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So the first thing it says there, the plans of the heart belong to man. You have plans, but God is sovereign. You have plans, but they do not jeopardize the sovereignty of God. Verse 33, same chapter. 
It says the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. What does that mean? What's the lot? The lot is what the high priest had. The high priest had these two stones. They were the Urim and the Thummim. Two stones that they held in the breastplate right there. And when there was a decision to be made, they would take these stones out. They would cast the stones right there. And they would trust that God would orchestrate in his, his sovereignty the answer for them. Now you're saying, well, where can I get? Can I pick up these uh, stones at a novelty store? Does somebody sell these stones online? Where do I have to go to get these stones that I can just roll out onto the ground and find the direction of God in my life? We don't, have, we don't have those stones that you can purchase today, but what we do have is Scripture, and you already hold it in your hand. Thank you. You don't need two stones to be rolling on the ground. So what is being said here, it means the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord, and the lot is cast, but it's every decision is from the Lord. It means I'm able to do something, yes, but God oversees. God oversees my decisions. Now you think, do I have a choice in my life? Are there choices I get to make in my life, or is every decision, is every decision already predetermined by God? Well, here's the mystery part of it. Do you get a choice, or is every decision already predetermined by God? The answer is yes, both and. I told you it's a mystery. You say, well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. That's the mystery of the guidance of God. The passage says it's the plans of the heart belong to the man. Those are your plans. Verse 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. That, that's your works. Commit your work. Verse 9 says, The mind of man plans his way. See, God's going to hold you accountable to your plans. God's going to hold you accountable to your choices, but yet he is still sovereign over all of it. Now, that's good news. You say, well, I don't don't agree with that. That's fine. That's fine if you don't agree with it because Calvin himself couldn't solve this mystery. Luther could not solve the mystery. Wesley could not solve the mystery. MacArthur cannot solve the mystery. And the person who wrote down Proverbs, Solomon himself, it was still a mystery to Solomon. So you don't have the answer either. You've got to leave it in the hands of God, his sovereignty. Do you have choices to make? Yes. Are you accountable to your choices? Yes. But just because you make a boneheaded choice does not remove the sovereignty of God. So back in verse 1, the plans of the heart belongs to man, but God directs his steps. The Bible does not teach that you are all on your own, that God is hands off, that God is not aware, that God is unattentive to what you are doing. The Bible does not teach that at all, and it doesn't teach that every choice of yours is already predetermined, that everything is set in stone. God's sovereignty knows what's going to happen. He knows the choice you're going to make. Absolutely yes. What it does, what scripture does teach us is that you have in your free will, you do not then jeopardize the sovereignty of God. You're having trouble grasping this. I can tell. It is because it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Let me, let me say this. If you thought, if I thought every decision I ever made was all on me, if I thought every decision I ever had to make was all on me, would I make another decision in my life? No. You wouldn't either. If I thought the decisions I'm going to make this afternoon, tonight, and tomorrow were all upon my shoulders, would I make another decision? I would not. What I would do is I'd immediately go home, I would jump in bed, and I'd pull the covers up over my head, and I would never get out again because I don't want to make another decision. 
Do you have, do you, you remember making, I mean, I know you make decisions now. I'm just really hoping that it gets a little bit more simple the older I get, the decisions I have to make. I'm really looking forward to maybe a time where the decisions I have to make only affect myself and Amy and they don't affect the other two people that are living in my household because I live in fear of those decisions. Carol is shaking her head, no, you're going to live in fear of decisions for the rest of your life, I guess. You people are giving me no hope because it stresses me out, it crushes my heart to think about what a decision I might make, who all it affects. But do you know that just because I make a wrong decision once, that does not mean that God says, all right, God is sovereign. He's going to help you work through your decision, even though you make a wrong decision. Has anybody, have you ever heard the old saying, well, that's your, you made your bed, you got to sleep in it? That's your little red wagon, you got to pull it, something like that. You loaded up your cart you got to pull it now you've got to bear the load your choice has consequence but God does not abandon you I need to know that when I give some advice to my children or to somebody else that even though I might have good intentions it might have been wrong that God doesn't say so much so tough luck tough luck just because you made a decision when you were a teenager and maybe it, 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 it affected you in a great mighty way, God has not severed himself from you for the rest of your life because you, you made a mistake. We have a loving God who is attentive, who is ever present with us. So the scripture does not teach that your free will threatens God's sovereignty. Let me ask you this. Have you ever made a bad decision and it worked out? Have you think about that. Have you ever made a bad decision and it worked out? It's a good thing Barry's here because I'm going to use him again. Barry walked in this morning. He said, you get your truck back. And I said, yes. I said, did your dad tell you the story of my truck? And, and I don't know if this is a bad decision or good decision or if it didn't matter, a hill of beans to God one way or the other. Uh, and it probably didn't. God probably didn't care left or right if I got a new truck. But I did. We went out and got a new-to-you truck. Amy did. Amy got a truck, and she's letting me drive it. So thankful for that. Uh, so... I, I told him, I said, well, I'm going to give you the story of this here in just a moment. And so, so I got this truck. I don't know if it's a bad decision. I got this truck. I hated to trade my other. I loved my other truck. I loved that truck. Uh, separation disorder. I grieved that little truck. I miss it. But so I went out and got another truck and uh, test drove it. Fine. Another Dodge. Uh, another Hemi. Had to be a Dodge. Had to be a Hemi. You know, nobody else makes vehicles. But... Uh, so I, I, on the way home, I called the guy up. I said, hey, this, this, the driver's side vent's blowing great over here on the air conditioner, but the passenger vent, is, they're just weaker than weak. They're, they're not working real good. And he said, well, bring it back in next time you're in town and let us look at it. So I brought it back in. I said, man, something's fishy over here. I said, I tried, I've been trying to look at this stuff myself. I said, I got this little light down here that's blinking and telling me all kinds of things are wrong. And, and uh, the, the, I hear the air back there. I hear it blowing, but it's just not getting to the dash here. It's not blowing out on the passenger side. I said, somebody's been in this thing monkeying around. I said, somebody's been doing some stuff behind the dash, and I don't know what it is. He says, okay. He says, he says well, this is going to take some time. Let us, let's get you a loaner car, and you write down everything that you see that's wrong, and, and bring it, and uh, we'll call you, and you drop it back off, and we'll keep it for a few days. I said, all right, sounds good. So I wrote the lights weren't coming on, and uh, I wrote down some other stuff in the engine compartment there underneath the hood. Little clips were missing and stuff to get to the back of the dash. So I bring the thing back to him, and I said, all this stuff is related. I said, I don't know what it is, but all of it's related. He said, let us look at it. Well, this was Perkins in Mayfield. And uh, so I guess Perkins looked at it all of a total of about two hours and said, this is beyond us, and they sent it down to Driver Motor in Mayfield, the Dodge place in Mayfield, wherever, whoever that is. Uh, 
They sent it down to them to let the Dodge place look at it. Three weeks later, or longer, I don't know how long it was. It was this, this what? Amy makes payments. I don't know. I told you it's her truck. She says it's been paid for. It's paid for. But, uh, or at least one payment. Uh, so three weeks later, three weeks later, I finally decide to go to the Dodge place in Mayfield and ask them, hey, how's it going with my vehicle there? And they said, you need to come with us. I said, all right. And uh, they said, something's going on with your vehicle. I said, oh, I believe it. I believe this. They said, we have ordered parts for this. We have, there are parts on back order till kingdom come. We don't know when they're coming in. Uh, we can't find them anywhere. And, and they said, we, here's what we think's happened. We think your truck has been in, on the border of Texas, and it's crossed over a few times. And I said, were they smuggling dope in that? And they said, that's what we think, because they removed your dash and just gutted the back of your dash and put carpet back there. They fixed it up nice and neat so that they could haul something behind the dash. Now, I asked Perkins about that. Perkins said, we think they're carrying exotic animals behind there. I said, well, I said, you can think exotic animals if you want to, but I'm thinking the other. So when Dot, Dot, the place in Mayfield told me, though, I got the truck back. I'm driving it, hoping it's fine. Please, Lord, take care of it. I got the thing back. It's all fixed up. They got the parts. They had to order a whole storeroom of parts. I can't imagine the bill. Perkins held, Perkins took care of it. I'll give them that. They took care of it. They give them credit for that. They stood behind it, fixed it, and they told me it was just like it came from the factory. But I'm telling you that because it's just a little lighthearted story. Did I make a bad decision? I may have made a bad decision because when I brought the thing home, there was something a little fishy, a little, a little, I was a little wigged out about the whole thing before I knew anything was wrong. There was something in me saying there's something behind this thing right here. Did I make a bad decision? I don't know, but God's sovereign. Even because I make a stupid decision, that doesn't mean God's going to abandon me, okay? That's why I tell you that story, because I know you listen to stories, you like stories, at my expense, so that's why I shared it with you. God's there when you make a bad decision. Now, the other side of it is if everything was predetermined, if all your choices, if all of your choices were already predetermined by God, that would remove you of free will. And that's not what the scripture teaches either. So all of your choices are not already predetermined because if all of your choices were already predetermined by God, then again, we might as well just go home. This time we can sit on the lazy boy or the couch. We can get out a gallon of ice cream and just eat that whole thing ourselves with a bag of chips and dip as well. And just watch TV if everything was already predetermined by God. But Scripture does not teach that either. Scripture does not teach that, that uh, you're removed from all of consequence. Scripture does not teach that everything is predetermined for you as well. Tim Keller said this. The Bible does not say your choices have no connection to your destiny. Or that your choices determine your destiny. But rather... God and his sovereignty relates your choices partially to your destiny. So you can be thankful that you have a free will, but you also have a sovereign God who works in the midst of your free will. Okay? Here's a biblical illustration. I gave you a silly one of mine, but this is a much more serious and much more truthful um, historical story here from the Old Testament. You remember the story of Joseph. You remember the favoritism of his father. Well, Joseph, let's look at how choices affect. Choices affect, but even though we make bad choices, that does not mean it's going to turn out bad. That God's sovereignty works in the midst of bad choices. So you have Joseph, you have his father, who his father is, is all the time telling the, uh, Joseph is young, his father is all the time telling Telling uh, the, the older boys, hey, you're go, you're, he's favored. He's always treating him special. Joseph is the one who wakes up every other day and says, hey, I've had a dream from God, and you're all going to bow down to me. Can you imagine how popular Joseph is in the sight of his brothers? His brothers don't like him. They've got a problem with him. So what do they come up with? They fashion up the idea, we've got to kill this guy. So that's their choice. That's their choice is they're going to take Joseph out, and they're going to kill him. 
because they're sick and tired of him. So what does Judah do? Judah shows up and says, hey, we really can't. Let's don't just kill him. Let's sell him off to be a slave. So he, he comes up with this choice. Let's sell him off to be a slave. So he's sold off to be a slave. He ends up in whose house? Potiphar's house. And what does Potiphar's wife do? Potiphar's wife tries to make an advance on Joseph. And what does Joseph do? Joseph stands firm. Joseph says, I'm not going to fall for this crap. I'm not going to fall for this garbage. So what happens? Potiphar's wife accuses him of something. Joseph gets thrown in jail, right? Thrown in jail. Thrown in jail. Does he ever hear from God? Never hears from He doesn't hear from God for a long time. While in jail, two other people, the, break, the baker and the cupbearer, their prayers, are, their dreams are answered. Joseph interprets them for them. Joseph hears from God. Takes him a while. But we know the story. Joseph ends up being the second man in Egypt. The highest, the second most powerful man in the then known world. What does he do? Joseph calls up, calls up his family, saves them from a famine. He saves Egypt from a famine as well. Protects them. There were a lot of bad choices made at the beginning. Joseph is in a position of authority now, saves his family, saves the nation from famine, and then dad dies. Dad dies, and the brothers know who Joseph is. And what do they do? They send word to Joseph and say, hey, we're pretty sure you're going to kill us now. You're going to come back to us for revenge. But what does Scripture say that Joseph told them? What you intended for evil against me, God intended for good. So just when there are bad choices, just when there are bad choices does not mean God is not at work. God still works in the midst of, of, of silly choices, silly decisions. Verse 9 there, 16, chapter 16. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God is in control. The Lord directs. The Lord gives, he establishes the steps. He gives foundation. He gives firmness. He directs into a position. He moves. He's directing the position to move into. That's what happens. The man plans his way, but the Lord is still sovereign. He is in control. He moves in a position even in the midst of your choices, God is still at work. God is directing. The problem is, here's what the problem is. We want God to airmail us or drop us something down from heaven. We want God to drop us the plan for our life down from heaven. Show me what, my, what the plan is for me, God, and I'll determine in my own ability if this is the path I want to take or not. That's the way we look at it. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. God's guidance for your life comes from his word. See, I told you, you don't need those two stones anymore. You have the guidance you need for your life in his word right here. You're holding it. Throughout chapter 16 in Proverbs, you're going to see a phrase mentioned. And I've always told you, whenever you see a phrase repeated, over a few times, you need to pay attention to it. And the phrase that is repeated uh, five, six, seven, eight times is the Lord. The Lord. Solomon keeps saying, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. It's almost like Solomon is, is, is crying out to you, calling out to you, come back to the Lord, seek the Lord for guidance, seek the Lord for direction. He guides you. Psalm, Psalm 119 verse 130 says, says this, the entrance of his word brings light. When God's, you, you're, you're trying to make a decision for yourself, for yourself and your life. You're trying to make a decision for the family or for the kids. Where, where are you going to get that information to make that decision? Psalm says, the entrance of his word brings light. You're in a dark place. You're like, what do I do? The entrance of his word shines light on the situation. So we need to quit we need to quit hopping around. 
See, we, we hop around from thing to thing and we, we think whatever makes me feel good is the direction that God wants me to go in my life. But what we need is his word to illuminate because there are potholes out there in, in, in life. There are potholes, there are, there are cliffs that we can fall off, there are stumbling blocks out there for us. There are places with loose footing, there are traps for us and we need his, his word to shine a light on our direction. That's God's guidance for us. But what we do, we treat, we treat God and we treat the Bible as a drive through at Wendy's. We want to, you know, you go, you go to the drive through Why do you go to the drive through Because you're in a hurry. You're in a hurry and you want something speedy. You want something fast. God, you have to answer this immediately. God, you have to answer this quickly. Now, let me ask you. I don't know what the fanciest restaurant you've ever been to is, and I, I'm trying to think right now what the fanciest restaurant I've been to is, but what, I mean, even if you, okay, let's just forget the restaurant. Let's just say you go home and you cook, a, cook something on the grill. Does not your home-cooked grill served steak taste better than the Wendy's drive through Amen. That's, we go to God because we want a drive through experience because we're in a hurry and we want something immediately. We want something answered immediately. When what God is saying, you need to practice some patience because the thing that simmers out there on that charcoal grill at just the right temperature when it's ready to be served up, it is just the right flavor, just the right juiciness, just the right savoriness in your mouth, and you enjoy it so much more than that drive through experience. So quit treating, quit treating God's word as a drive through. Be patient, exercise patience in his word. Look what, went, went, what, look what happened to Job. Job experienced all, uh, everything was taken away from Job, but yet what did Job do? Job said, I will continue to submit to God's will in my life. Job was restart, re, re, uh, replenished. He was tenfold, given back to him tenfold, restored tenfold to what he had. What do we do? What's, what's the most, what's the thing we do? We, we hop around and we go everywhere, uh, just, just like with my truck. What's the first thing I did when I, my, you know, as I, I call the guy on the way home, say, hey, something's a little fishy about this. And what do I do when I get home? I immediately get on Google. You Google instant answer. If you, if you don't Google it, you YouTube it because you want to see how to, to fix it. We go to Google for for we go to Google for spiritual stuff. We go to YouTube. If you're following somebody on YouTube or Googling your spiritual needs, then you're looking in the wrong place. I mean, it's okay to get a scripture verse from there or something like that, but you need to let the Holy Spirit interpret that for you. Because some of the people out there are just a little fruity. But we do that. We go to Google, we go to YouTube because we want somebody to think to think for us. But God has given you the ability to think. Ephesians chapter 5, 15, 17. I'll just read it to you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. That's what we've been looking at. We've been looking at the wisdom of God all through these last several messages making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Walk in the will of the Lord so that you do not look foolish, so that you are not foolish in what you're doing. And God's wisdom is available to us. But, but our our natural default tendency is to get that instant gratification or instant satisfaction of, of 
getting some wisdom from some place like a drive through or we get our wisdom from the magazine rack or the tabloid section, or we get our wisdom from CNN or Fox News or any other uh, outlet that, that's out there or social media that's out there. And we think that's where I have to get my, my knowledge from. Last verse and we're done. Back at Proverbs 16.3, it says commit. Now that's commit. Now you probably want to make a note here. Uh, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. What does commit mean? It means to roll, to roll your work upon the Lord. It means to turn your work over to the Lord. When you turn your work over to the Lord, his plans will be established. Because it will, your plan will be established, but which will be his plan for you. Your plans will be established because you will see what his plan is for you in your life. Now, let me ask you this last question. Have you trusted God with your eternity? Have you trusted God with your eternity? Do you trust God with your eternity? Do you really trust God with eternity? If you can trust him with eternity, why can you not trust him with the present day? See what I'm saying? You say you have full faith in God that he's going to take care of you through all eternity. Then live like it today and trust him that he has the decision, the direction, the guidance for you today in your life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, you remember them, they were going to the fiery furnace because they were not going to bow down and worship an idol. They were not going to bow down and worship a king. And the king, the king pulls them up there, and they had no idea if God would save them from that fire or not. They knew that God could save them, but they did not know if he would save them. But they had enough sense to know I do not worship an idol. Every man can be a liar, but God himself is true. You do not give in just because, what did your parents always tell you? Well, if so-and-so is going to jump off a bridge, are you going to do it too? Right? Thank you. Just because the rest of society goes to pot does not mean you follow suit and do it as well. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they saw society going to pot. They said, we're not following that road. God can save us if he wants to. We know he can. They trusted God with their eternity. They trusted God with today as well. Do you trust him with today? Have you trusted him with forever also? I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Go ahead and bow your head and go ahead and stand if you would. God is at work. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you may venture in tomorrow, God is at work. You make a silly decision, a knuckle-headed uh, remark. You stumble on something. God doesn't leave you to put the pieces back together. 